All right. So this is lecture number 31 in the lecture series on creating an international sustainable civilization. So in the last one, I talked about Hinduism and um, its basic tenets and why it would definitely promote uh, a sustainable culture, the integration of culture and nature, which is not surprising. Um, and why is it that India doesn't seem to be doing that? Well, it would be colonialism. It would be the international economic system, which is based on exploiting nature. So developing countries have given up their cultures in order to adapt to the economic system. But in a systems view, I mean, in the next paradigm, we have to have a paradigm shift. And as we shift, we should call out, call forth some of those wisdom traditions and integrate them with the contemporary systems paradigm that includes science, of course, and social science technology, but the bigger picture is to have a culture, have children raised, to care about the natural world around them and to want to live sustainably. Um, this lecture is about some examples of, uh, first of all, mostly Gandhi. Gandhi is a prophet. So we have the prophetic tradition. And so I'll show how Gandhi fits that model of the prophet. Also Aristotle's, um, model of uh, how the icons lived in each of those traditions and um, the connection between being a prophet and social justice and being a prophet and staying connected to a holistic view and integrating culture and nature. All right, so my excerpts are taken from the book Gandhi, His Life and Message for the World. The reason I pick this book, these quotes, is it, uh, it um, reinforces or um, discusses some patterns that I've already discussed that we keep finding, repeating themselves over and over. So, so, um, here is Gandhi's life story is a typical story of ambitious people in developing nations coming to the West to study and become Westerners, Westernized. There was assumption, the assumption, the cultural superiority complex, that if you really wanted to become a real civilization, you needed to be Western because the West was more civilized and more sophisticated. And so the argument now is that that was the kind of brainwashing you have to do as part of colonialism. You colonize the minds and the hearts of your best and brightest, send them back, and they will lead their societies. Uh, they will enable or promote their societies in the next wave of colonization. They will adapt to however the colonizers, whatever they command. Um, at age 19, he went to London to study law and he tried to imitate the British. There's also a movie about this, which I think is really nice. Um, it's called Gandhi, I think. He wore their clothes, he listened to their music, he ate their food. He's really trying to be Western. He read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which I, we're going to talk about in a few lectures from now. He said it went straight to his heart. Then he read the Bhagavad Gita for the first time. So this is supposedly kind of the main holy book of his own tradition, but he hadn't even read it. And so this happens. I have a lot of students who self-identify as Christian, but they don't even know the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' mission statement. 
Uh, so they really did pick and choose a lot. And they were quoting more from the Old Testament than the New Testament. And Jesus' Sermon on the Mount rejects certain tenets in the Old Testament. It rejects some of the Ten Commandments or overcomes them or brings them to a newer level. I would say flat out reject some of them, but it's a different ethos. Um, it's the what the St. Thomas called the old law and the new law, but my students aren't even aware of that. So, so Gandhi read the Bhagavad Gita. He said it produced a tremendous impact, which remained throughout his life. When doubts haunt me, when disappointments stare me in the face, I turn the, to the Bhagavad Gita and find a verse that comforts me. So if you remember, the main theme in the Gita was the Orthodox, okay, was that Arjuna's cousins had committed a great injustice. And so it was his religious duty to fight against his cousins. He didn't really want to do that. And so Krishna came down, uh, incarnation of Vishnu, and said, do it, but be detached when you do it. Don't get your ego caught up in it. Don't be brutalized by it. Uh, the Greeks have a Ares, the god of war. And when he, war brutalizes him, but he he likes, he he's um, aggressive. That's his forte is to be really aggressive and he's condemned by Zeus the god of justice Athena the goddess of wisdom and justice and Hera the goddess of honor so the story is trying to get the Greeks don't honor that kind of brutality it's not just and it's not wise so the same sort of theme goes on here in the Gita that Sometimes war is necessary, but you have to do it. Keep in mind the just cause. Don't forget. Don't kill unnecessarily. Don't take revenge. Um, try to, to um, solve it in any other way possible. If you can't, don't become brutalized by um, war. So the Orthodox Hindu interpretation is a divine summons to cast obligation. And, and so sometimes if you're a member of a caste, you have an obligation to kill people threatening the country or, um, well, because you're a member of a certain caste, you need to belong to the military and it's part of your responsibility. But killing was repugnant to Gandhi and even read, when he first read the book, okay, he called it, he thought of it as an allegory in which the battlefield of the soul is really, and Arjuna, the battlefield is the soul, and Arjuna is man's higher impulses struggling against evil. So um, many of those books, well, the Greek myths, He's not alone. Um, I think those ancient myths, those stories are really intended to be read allegorically, right? They're really about these battles inside of us. So Krishna told Arjuna, the ideal is action in a just cause without thought of advantage. Hold alike pleasure and pain, gain and loss, victory and defeat, and gird your loins for the right. Just focus on the just cause, getting the job done, but without excess violence or emotional um, engagement, really. There is a unique reward. The great yogis, the Mahatmas, or great souls have come to me, Krishna, to reach the highest perfection. So Gandhi went back to India, but he was a bad lawyer. At one point, his brother needed legal assistance. But he, when he went to the law office, the British, um, he was treated with disgust. So here was Gandhi, and the movie has this scene. 
Um, he was all dressed up. He was all westernized. He had totally bought into it. Here's the legal system. It's better than ours. He goes in there and the British treat him like dirt. And the British were clearly racist. Even when he tried desperately to become British, he, they would never accept him. And it wasn't because they were so civilized. In South Africa, he got kicked out of the first class car on a train, even though he had paid. Those two episodes made the man. Is it true that how do we tell our stories? Do the episodes make the man or does the man make the episodes? Or I think all of you have certain experiences in your life that are turning points and they're very much affect how you set your goals in life and how you move forward in life. So Gandhi began a movement against white racism. He quote, and I think this is very important. It has always been a mystery to me how men can feel themselves honored by the humiliation of their fellow human beings. I think this is not only really important, but it's especially important in a democracy. You can't have a democracy if people have that emotion. And it's especially important in people who claim to identify with any sort of spiritual tradition, because those traditions do not advocate that kind of superiority complex. In the Greeks, you have characters who have it, but those characters are exposed as being wrong and corrupt. They're guilty of pride, hubris, the worst crime, because pride and hubris uh, trigger things like war because you violated my pride, or I want to prove that I can beat up on these people. Um, it triggers things like lust. Somehow I can use another person as the tool for my sexual gratification. Um, pride is behind a whole lot of stuff. Toxic emotions, actions, and cultures. So how do you overcome racism, sexism, and class discrimination. And um, all of these traditions, or in Confucius' case, the, the modification, the adaptation of Confucianism, Confucianism at this point in time is trying to overcome racism, sexism, and class discrimination. But Gandhi got involved in raising his children he and his wife cleaned chamber pots. This was radical. I mean, this was super radical. So people in India were happy when he started a movement to get rid of the British. But for him, it was spiritual. And that went a lot deeper than a power struggle. You had to purify your soul and you had to live at a higher level. And so sexism is wrong, you know? It's another form of power and violence. It's um, unspiritual, right? It's it's a corruption of the human spirit. Um, at having these roles where women take care of kids and men don't, he thinks is also a spiritual corruption and making other human beings clean your chamber pot, which is where you go to the bathroom at night because you don't want to walk outside and go to the uh, latrine, the outhouse or whatever they called it. So, um, so this was all, and again, all the traditions, Confucianism, less so, you have to adapt it, but Muhammad, Jesus, Socrates, Buddha, and Gandhi all were against racism, sexism, class discrimination, religious discrimination, anything like that. He had a focus on austerity and self-control. That's an Aristotelian virtue. Gandhi's religion made him political and his politics was religious. 
So he always um, talked about satagriya, which is translated truth force. There's a force. Uh, love is a force. And um, this is true in Christianity, in Islam, in Buddhism. All of these traditions have the same. Getting in touch with the Atman is being in love with the universe. And it's getting along with other people. Soul force is the vindication of truth, not by infliction of suffering on the opponent, but on oneself. So you have to train yourself to overcome aggression, fear, all these things, um, and replace it with love. Gandhi was a reformer of Hinduism, like Buddha, and we will find out about Buddha next time, I think. Gandhi looked beyond national freedom to social liberation, the methods and morality of administrators, not their nationality. So when British methods and morality was bad, he called it out. But when um, people from India who were Hindu behaved the same way, he called that out too. And so um, you'll see that happening again and again in the leaders of all these traditions. So Gandhi's movement grew. So India, 1915, the caste system in India, the privileged class wanted the British to give them power. So there was no real social reform or justice. So um, Gandhi started this village uplift, which in Indonesia would be Gotong Royong, the, nice, the notion of village uplift. So university community engagement projects would be consistent with what Gandhi um, tried to do. So that's where he, he they built um, uh, looms to make their own cloth. They built little pans to go out and get salt water and let the water evaporate, make their own salt. So he did this. He taught poor people how to be self-reliant and how to engage in economic boycotts so the British couldn't keep exploiting them. Indians helped the British during World War I, but they were not given any rights when the war was over. So they expected, you know, if they're helping the British, the British actually need help, that they would be treated better, but they were not. So then the Indians started with economic boycotts. They refused to buy things in British companies and they started to become self-reliant. The hostility between the Muslims and Hin Hindus uh, be, um existed and after the British left, it got worse and hostility between Indians from different castes, especially the hostility between the untouchables and the other castes. All of these things Gandhi sort of anticipated and he tried to overcome even before the British had left. Gandhi was worshiped as a reincarnation of Vishnu because it's as if he came down to try and redeem the world. He didn't want to be considered this because he thought everyone should find the soul force in themselves. It's not just, you know, don't worship me, just get in touch with your own soul force. And then you'll realize I'm living the way you would live if you were in touch with that. And um, I think Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad, they didn't they didn't want to be worshipped. They wanted their lives to be an, an example, just an example of what kind of what life would look like if you love God and love your neighbor, if you stay in touch with the Atman. Weaving, okay, they wove their own cloth, they made their own salt. And then there is a story of the Salt Works massacre. I usually read this story in my class, but it's long and so it's in the book. Um, people were going to 
demonstrate. And there was a salt works factory and they just, it's a symbolic act. You go up there and you start climbing up the fence to break into the salt works. And they had people lined up 25 in a row and they marched down. You had to go in this little ditch and then you climbed up and then you start climbing the fence. And there was a British man who commanded the police officers who were from India. And so, you know, the British made the people from India do all the dirty work. So they're actually killing or maiming each other. So this is, and rich people do this even in the US. They will pit working class against underclass. So they gave people in India a really good job, but, you know, paid well, good benefits, much higher standard of living, but this is what you have to do. And so you see the people in, the people from India beating up on the demonstrators and their sticks contained uh, steel inside of them. And so many of them had cracked skulls. Some of them died, but they were in pain. And so 25 March get beaten up, bodies get dragged off, 25 more. And they kept doing that and doing that and doing that for like a whole week or two weeks. I mean, just, <clears throat> and in the book, the author says that was the end of it. I mean, the British had not yet left, but it was a victory because it was a spiritual victory, because people in Britain saw what was going on. And they knew, everybody knew, this is not going to last. The British are not going to put up with this. They're, you know, British people are, are going to say enough. And the people in India know they have the advantage because they've proven that the West is not morally superior or culturally superior. And they're not gonna to listen to that anymore. That's when, you know, so much for Gandhi's desire to be Western. He doesn't wanna be Western. Westerners are racist and violent and wicked and merciless, right? So that was the end. That was really the battle. First, you have to have a spiritual battle before the physical battles end. And this is one of my main keys. What the reason wars exist is because people have some sort of argument in their head about why they need to go to war. And their spirit, you know, supports it. Their emotions, they're all in. But if they change their mind or their heart, even if they're actually still fighting and their heart isn't in it anymore, they're not going to win. It will fade. And so it is very important that you always figure out why are we fighting? Why are we fighting this entire war? What was the cause? And then why are we here in this particular campaign? And why are we fighting in this way? And why are we killing people rather than imprisoning them? And why are we torturing them rather than just putting on and on? So always you should be questioning every step of any war. Otherwise, you're going to end up with brutality. That's, you know, the only, it's very hard. How do you have a civilized war? How do you kill your, your, um, kill members of your own species in the name of some good. So the point is uh, we should minimize war and, and you should never treat people this way. So you can win um, a conflict just through spiritual means, not who has the most weapons. Um, Gandhi embraced Christ, but he rejected Christianity. Why? Much of what passes as Christianity is the negation of the Sermon on the Mount. Another big theme, what happens when Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad 
uh, the Hindu gurus, what happens when, when that becomes institutionalized and when the people in the Brahmin class or the religious class um, are invested in terms of their status, their power, and their money. Well, then it gets corrupt and it has to be called out. So somebody else can just read the Sermon on the Mount like Gandhi and say, this is a really good religion. You ought to try it. <laughs> try it. You might like it. Um, and I, I find that personally very odd that you that a preacher could read the Sermon on the Mount in a mega church and people wouldn't look around and go, huh? Doesn't does anybody else think we're a bunch of hypocrites? Or the preacher could read it in a very fundamentalist. Every word of the Bible is true. And uh, and people look around and go, but Jesus said not every word in the Bible is true. <laughs> it So, you know, we have popularized versions. And then we have, well, actually, when you read it, what was Jesus trying to teach? What kind of life did he live? Same true, same is true in all these traditions. Okay, then there's World War II. And you have to realize also that the West was supposed to be this free, equal, democratic, human rights, blah, blah, as opposed to this religion, tradition, uh, caste system, blah, blah. And yet look what's happening in Europe. It's being taken over by right-wing authoritarians, fascists, and they're killing each other. So the Westerners, they don't believe in or they reject what we were told was their tradition. You know, they're Nazis, they fight, they're blindly patriotic. They don't respect human rights at all. Um, they don't even, you know, they elected Hitler, but once he got elected, no more election. He's authoritarian. So Gandhi respected the British resistance against Hitler. So the British were against him and Gandhi respected that. But he resented the British continued oppression of Indians. Right? So supposedly the British are protecting freedom and human rights, blah, blah, against the Germans. But how come they don't treat people in India with freedom, human rights, and all those wonderful British Western values. So with Winston Churchill was the prime minister and he gets, you know, everybody loves Churchill because of the way he inspired the British when the Germans were bombing them. I don't, I don't, you know, I would imagine just about every American knows that story when the British went down into the, into the, um, the tube, the subways, which were like three layers thick. And that's where they went. And the Germans bombed London to the ground and all sorts of things. Of course, we went and bombed Europe quite well ourselves. But anyway, so Winston Churchill, you know, kept up their spirits up. But when he went in his relation to India, he was just awful. He was so racist. He said, Gandhiism has to be crushed. He said, I didn't get elected prime minister to watch the British Empire break apart, you know, and I'm not going to do this. Um, he was forced eventually to sign a pact and let India go free. But this was after many attempts by Gandhi and many uh, rejections, a lot of bad faith. Um, but the problem was eventually because then the tension between the Muslims and the Hindus arose. So eventually there was a split into Pakistan and India and Gandhi felt like a failure because he failed to change India spiritually. And that was his real goal. It was much more than just getting the British out. It was much more than just a power struggle much more than just about money and uh, you know making your own money or whatever. Um, 
So he did feel like a failure at the end of his life. And the, the person who assassinated him was actually a Hindu who disagreed with the direction that he wanted to take the country. Okay, so Thomas Merton wrote an essay called Gandhi and the One-Eyed Giant. And that one-eyed giant is Western culture. It's too one-sided. And so Gandhi realized that his society had something to offer the West, that the West really needed. One of the great lessons of Gandhi's life remains that through the spiritual traditions of the West, and I would hope that my Indonesian colleagues or other people from developing countries who might be listening to these, this lecture, that this happens to you also. Through the spirit, spiritual tra traditions of the West, he, an Indian, discovered his Indian heritage and with it, his own right mind. So he was able to balance out. He was able to see the truth, see the good, what the Greeks would call mind, practical wisdom. He was able to see human flourishing and the best way to, to promote flourishing in India versus in Britain. In India, it was not to try to become British. It was to try to become authentically Hindu and then self-governing. So a Hindu who is spiritually faithful would not despise Muslims. And it would not have happened if, if the Hindus had been faithful to their tradition, uh, much less the Muslims. But the Hindus were the majority then and and uh, all this animosity it was all just about power and money and Gandhi was very very disappointed at in his own people in his fidelity to his own heritage and its spiritual sanity be faithful to Hinduism he was able to show people in the West and other and the, around the world a way to recover their own right mind in their own tradition, thus manifesting the fact that there are certain indisputable and essential values, religious, ethical, ascetic, spiritual, and philosophical. Um, all right, so we are once again back at the same theme. Um, and I do want to emphasize to you that I didn't, these people did not read each other's books. This was not, you know, in some sort of condensed reader. I just read books, that's all. Any old books. And they all end up coming up to the same conclusion. So the perennial philosophy, the primordial philosophy, this basic Aristotelian virtues foundation. It keeps coming back again. Gandhi's message represented the awakening of a new world. The idea was of a spiritual reality to life. And so when the working group, the conference met uh, with uh, Pope Francis, Laudato Si, the Paris Accord, the UN Sustainability Goals, those were supposed to be guidelines for science and technology, but they were also guidelines for spirituality and culture. They weren't supposed to be separated. And economics, of course. One of the great lessons of Gandhi, okay, whoops. Gandhi's vow of truth, Satagriya, and all the other ashram vows, he lived in an ashram, were the necessary preamble to the awakening of a mature political consciousness. So the question here is, what is a mature political consciousness? And this is really important. Um, and the Greeks, you know, had, I argue their culture is constructed to develop a mature political consciousness practical wisdom, the ability to make good decisions, 
And for the Greeks, you really need to understand human character. You need to understand all the flaws different people have, all the extremes that they go to, all the arguments that they give for it, all the character types that are formed around these, these um, by extreme points of view. You really need to have to know everything if you can finally sit down and make a good judgment and also be persuasive in your arguments. Um, so Gandhi had a different model, I think, of a mature political consciousness, but they aren't antithetical and they all the goal is always practical wisdom. So that's the common ground. A mature political consciousness is a person who has phronemos, a phronemos. He's very good at sitting the art of deliberation and figuring out what to do in each situation that will maximize human flourishing. All the political acts of Gandhi were at the same time spiritual and religious acts. They were meaningful on at least three different levels at once. First, as acts of religious worship. Second, as symbolic and educative acts, bringing the Indian people to a realization of their true needs and their place in the life of the world. And finally, so the second one is to bring, you know, colonized countries need to realize they have something to contribute, which is what I'm trying to tell Indonesians. Um, uh, Gandhi wanted to tell the people in India, you, you don't need to bow your head down to the West. You have something to contribute. The unmaking of political falsehood, the awakening of all people th to the demands of the time and to the need for renewal and unity on a world scale. This is it, very important today, right? The demands of the time are to go green and we need renewal and unity and we need a unified agreement that we must change our economic system. It's got to stop being based on fossil fuel. It's got to stop being based on individuals rationally, rationally calculating the most efficient means to their economic self-interest. It's got to stop being based on adversarial, competitive, zero-sum game, I win, you lose. And it has to change to win-win. Okay, let's develop green products, Bill Gates will do it over here, Xi Jinping will do it over here, and they'll give each other ideas and they'll get better. They won't destroy each other where somebody has to win because ultimately nature does not care about our politics. Nature will try to heal herself as we try to destroy her. And we have to figure out how to get back in sync with her efforts to heal herself. And so that really is important. And it's just another wave in the same sort of trends. The greatest of man's spiritual needs is the need to be delivered from evil and falsity in himself and in his society. So the belief that this capitalist economic system is the best, is the most democratic, it's, it's all a lie, right? It's a lie about life. It's a lie about economics. It's a lie about human flourishing. And we have to replace it. Um, only the admission of defeat and fallibility in oneself makes it possible for one to become merciful to others. So I feel like um, as an American, I have a lot to um, account for in relation to my Indonesian counterpart. So I know that I have an advantage. I know that my standard of life depends on colonizing the earth and colonizing other people. I wanna use the talents that I have, opportunities to educate Indonesians, to learn from them, to encourage them and to tell them, you know, Use your talents, um, step up to the plate, 
call out the falsity. But also, Mr. Marif says, many of those Indonesians, when colonialism, they got rid of the colonizers, they start treating each other terribly. Okay, same thing happened in India. Um, and so we have to call out the corruption in your own country. You have to call out the corruption within Islam. You have to call out the corruption within political leaders who, who both sides use Islam as a weapon to just win political uh, elections and completely distort Islam. So all of that stuff needs to be flushed out. And Gandhi's life is a good example of a pattern where, look, if he couldn't do it, don't get too discouraged because it still needs to be done. And so you have to keep trying, okay? Whatever else Gandhi teaches us, it's that you have to keep trying because if you don't, it'll get worse. If someone like Gandhi feels like he was a failure at the end, if you don't even try, your country is going to be worse. So you have to keep trying. Um, a dialectic that ignores the presence of evil is itself dead because it is untrue. The only liberation is that which liberates both the oppressor and the oppressed. This is where the Greeks want you to have empathy with these characters that commit evil and just want you to be aware that you could do that if you were in that situation. So you have to uh, work at avoiding overreacting and trying to liberate yourself from these emotions. The only, okay, you also have to realize there's an oppressor oppressed situation in so much of the social context that we're in and just try to overcome it. But you can only do that through an examined life. The freedom contained in Jesus' teaching of forgiveness is the freedom from vengeance, which encloses both doer and sufferer in the relentless auto automatism of the action process, um, which by itself need never come to an end. So I think it's the relentless automatic um, way that we act and um, we have to stop that. Jesus lived and died in vain if he did not teach us to regulate all of our life by the eternal law of love. So um, Gandhi knows that, right? And he wants Americans and Westerners anybody who identifies as Christian to be more aware of their tradition. And if they were, we would have religious pluralism, we would have humanitarianism, we would have unity and diversity, and we would have a social contract and an, econ an, an economic system that worked with the political process. And there would be laws to tax the rich, to distribute money for education and health care. And there would be deliberation at every step of the way so that through the art of deliberation, we can come to practical wisdom about each of the steps we have to take and each of the, um, and then setting up a new goal step-by-step. Step. It's a very long process, but we have to start as soon as we can.